discussion on morality and criminal justice. This is one of two English language events at the Heidelberger Symposium. And we are happy to have uh, Professor Andrew Hamill and Professor Robert Blacker, who came all the way from New York. And I want to quickly introduce our moderator, which is um, Dr. Marcus Englert, who knows criminal law from theory and practice, who is a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Research and Collective Goods, and is also a legal consultant at a criminal law firm. So Marcus, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Julius, and um, thank all of you for coming. Um, let me say a few more words on the two gentlemen to my right, who actually have a surprising amount uh, of things in common. Both of them are American, both of them are law professors, both of them teach and have done research in criminal law and constitutional law. Both of them hold a degree from Harvard Law School, and both feel very strongly about the death penalty. This is, however, where the similarities end. Um, Robert Blacker, who some of you have already met and uh, experienced, is one of the principal advocates of retributive justice in the United States, a professor at New York Law School, and a strong defender as well of the death penalty. He has come all the way from New York Andrew's way was a bit shorter. He is a um, professor of law at the University of Dusseldorf. He also teaches criminal law, and, but his perspective, as you will see in the course of the discussion, is much more influenced by European thought and theory. He is um, not a retributivist, at least he doesn't consider himself one, and um, has written a book actually about the death penalty, which is called The Case Against the Death, Abolishing the Death Penalty, the uh, European Experience in Global Context. We will hear tonight from both of them, not about the death penalty, but what they think punishment should be all about, and what the primary purpose of all kinds of punishment is. So before we do that, please, um, let me, please give them both a welcome. Um, also, please cut all of us some slack. We're all tired, although for different reasons. Um, Robert Blacker is still suffering from jet lag, and he has already uh, absolved a very intensive program over the last couple of days. We've seen this movie, and actually, uh, the two of us spent four hours in the Heidelberg prison yesterday and um, went through a long conversation with several law professors. Uh, Andrew and me are also tired, but that's primarily because we were out until three in the morning until the last bar in Heidelberg kicked us out. So, um, <laughs> so please be generous with us and um, a few words on what we will do. We will start with an opening statement by both gentlemen of about 15 minutes, during which they will explain to you why, what they think, why we punish, what the purpose of punishment is, and how they arrived at this conclusion, and what it means in practice. Uh, then there will be um, three to five minutes for each of them to react to what the other person has said, and then a freewheeling conversation between the two of them. After that, we will throw it open to the audience for questions, and you'll get a chance to ask whatever you're interested to, to learn from the two of them. Um, Robert has repeatedly pointed out that he does not want this to be considered a formal debate, more a, an opportunity to search for common ground between two very different perspectives. I guess that's enough for me, and I think um, we can start with the first opening statement, and this one is by Robert Blacker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I suspect that will be the last applause I'll hear in the next uh, hours, but I appreciate it, at least initially. Uh, I am at a disadvantage not having spent time in the bar, but uh, behind bars. Um, and it's not about only what I think, it's very much about how I feel. And I'm actually hoping that there will be more of you who will be willing to say that you feel as I feel, but I, I might be wrong. Uh, one other preliminary comment, and then let me get to the substance of it. Um, 
Andrew Hamill's book, Ending the Death Penalty, is excellent. And if you want a, a, a really penetrating analysis of why Germany has uh, ended, how it, uh, the role of criminal justice policy and how it's transformed both historically and analytically, I really thoroughly recommend it to you. It's an excellent read and very well done. Okay, now, um, why do we punish? And why should we punish? And what should it be like? Well, there are two large perspectives from which you can draw in determining why we punish. One tends to look at the future and the other tends to look at the past. From the future orientation, which uh, this generation of Germans are much more familiar with and much more willing to articulate, at least publicly, regardless of how they feel privately, um, the purpose, the primary purpose of punishment is safety. And we achieve that safety either by deterring other people from committing crime through increased pressure from the threat of pain, which is what punishment is. It's painful. The loss of liberty is painful. And so the, the theory is that we alter the rational maximizer's uh, cost-benefit calculus in which the would-be criminal says, it's no longer worth it for me to act in such a way to get the immediate pleasure from the crime because now that becomes offset from my projection of what the pain is that I will suffer as a result, however more remote that is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's general deterrence. Uh, specific deterrence, which is also forward-looking, presupposes that the effect of having gone to prison or suffering any other punishment will be such as to change one's, uh, at the particular person who's gone through its attitude, and so alter it and make that person to, into a law-abiding citizen. Another future-oriented justification for punishment is incapacitation, and the theory is very simple, which is while the person, the criminal, is in prison, he or she will not be able to commit more crimes. And finally, in terms of future orientation, there is rehabilitation, which is essentially providing the person who is being punished with new skills and new values to enable them to, more, uh, to better integrate back into society and become a productive law-abiding member. If I stopped there, I would probably have at least summarily described the standard attitude, European attitude and German attitude, at least as it's expressed in the literature toward punishment. But I would also have failed, in my view, to discuss what should be and is the primary justification for punishment from my point of view, and I suspect from more points of view, remember, leaving the death penalty aside, let's by and large leave it aside for the next couple of hours. Let's assume we don't have one, and that's, that's not the issue. The issue is whether we intentionally inflict pain, unpleasantness, through the loss of liberty and or other sanctions, whether we do it not in order to achieve something in the future, not in order to alter the behavior of the person being punished, but because it's somehow just, justice, warranted, because it's somehow proportionate to the crime. When we say let the punishment fit the crime, we might mean let the punishment be adequate so as to alter future behavior and keep us safe, or we might be talking about something else. And what I would maintain is that the essence of justice consists in striking a balance and in acknowledging the past, in keeping a covenant with the past. And that when we strive for proportionate punishment, part of what makes a punishment proportional is the gravity of the crime. And part of what makes the crime more grave than another crime which would require a lesser punishment in order to do justice is not only the harm that occurs, but the attitude with which the harm is committed. That is to say, all other things equal, a person who acts negligently is less bad than a person who acts intentionally. Furthermore, all other things equal, because the harm does count partly, a person who injures has committed a less serious crime than a person who kills. Because death is the greater harm than mere injury, and intent is the greater culpable mental state than mere recklessness or negligence. And so for us retributivists, 
First of all, the past has a claim on us, a deep claim on us. The question for us is not solely what good will it do when addressed to punishment. The question is to a large degree, what bad has been done? How do you measure that bad? What culpable mental state was it done with? What were the motives of the criminal? And once you explore that, then you grade punishment in large part according to the crime. And you try to offset the crime with a punishment which is deserved. So that questions of guilt and moral blameworthiness are fundamental to the questions of punishment. And they are fundamental, as I hope our discussion will reveal, not only to how long is a prison sentence when it's warranted, but also to how long. That is, what is the actual day-to-day -day experience of those who are punished? So just to sum it up by way of a preliminary discussion, for us retributivists, the past counts. Rationality is not the strict and only bound of what constitutes justice. There is a real and right impulse to punish appropriately, and that appropriateness is measured in part by looking at the harm done and the culpable mental state and the motives of the person who did it. And so I hope this discussion will generate a look at what retribution is, what should it be, what role does it play, what role must it necessarily play in any system which is qualified to bear the term justice. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, Andrew, please let's hear your statement. Okay, this thing is on? Excellent. Um, there's a little green light here. I haven't worked with these microphones before. Oh, so anyway, I am Andrew Hamill, and uh, I suppose one thing that is probably worth mentioning is that I actually, uh, and uh, Professor Blecker here, has been in prison and talked to people in prison. He's spent hundreds of hours there and understands the psychology of offenders pretty well. And I also have some experience working with prison inmates. I don't have anywhere near as much as Robert Blecker because I was actually a lawyer for death row inmates in Texas. So I was, in German, you would say a, a Strafverteidiger, a Pflichtverteidiger. And I worked for a small nonprofit organization um, trying to prevent people from being executed in the state of Texas. And so as you can imagine, this was uh, a lot of work um, because Texas is very committed to the death penalty, unlike most American states. Um, you know, California has a lot of people on death row, but they don't get executed. But Texas puts you on death row and you get killed. And uh, so that's what I did graduating from law school because I found that when I went to law school, I was only interested in criminal law and I was only interested in sort of philosophical questions of retribution. And I also grew up in Texas and I found that the standard approach that Texas used to criminal justice, I found that to be extraordinarily brutal and cruel. And that basically Texas was throwing people away. And I thought that there was something fundamentally diseased and inhumane about that approach to criminal justice. And so I decided to go to work and, uh, and try to fight the death penalty. But I don't want to concentrate too much on the death penalty because that's not the main topic here. To me, the death penalty is a symbol or a sign of an approach to criminal justice that I found fundamentally inhuman and inappropriate and backward and outdated. I know these are just words and slogans, but once again, I think it's a question also of feeling. So I oppose the death penalty out from rational reasons and for reasons of cost and deterrence, etc. but mostly because I simply do not believe that the state should ever be able to take a human life. I don't think the state is capable of doing that properly. But it's also the case in the United States that people are sentenced to extraordinarily long prison terms by European standards. There's something like, I believe there's about 30,000 prisoners in the United States who are now sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. 
which means that they were sentenced, perhaps at the age of 20, and they will stay in prison until they die without this, any opportunity whatsoever of being released. And in fact, that will happen. And people have been sentenced to that, and their entire lives have been thrown away. And also in the United States, once you go to prison and you are released from prison, everybody can know about it. Your name is in a public database that anyone can search, which means you will never get a decent job for the rest of your life if you are convicted of any sort of serious crime. You are stamped and branded electronically and informationally so that for the rest of your life you will have much worse career potentials and you will never be able to escape the stigma of having been in prison. And so that is something I didn't actually know that there was an alternative approach to criminal justice until I came to Europe and began studying European criminal justice systems. I mean, I knew vaguely that there were other areas of the United States that put more effort into rehabilitation and reintegration, but you don't really see a system completely committed to those ideals until you come to Europe. And when I came to Europe, the first thing that struck me was how relatively violence-free life in Europe is. And so growing up in the city of Houston, it's a large, diverse, racially mixed city with a murder rate that was is skyrocketing in the early 1980s and is still fairly high. And you would never go a single day in Houston, Texas without seeing many police officers on the street. And these police officers were large, they wore bulletproof vests, and they carried weapons around with them at all times and you would be stopped by a police officer four or five times a year in Texas regularly, you know, to check on you or something like that. And I never thought of this as being troubling. I never thought of this as a sign of a breakdown in so social values until I came to Europe and traveled all around Europe and saw that there are almost no police officers around. I mean, I, I spent a year in Dusseldorf and I literally saw a police car three times in that entire year. And I wandered around at all hours of the day or night, even in questionable neighborhoods, and I was never attacked and never mugged. I mean, so, of course there is crime and violent crime. I'm not trying to downplay that. But there was not this pervasive sense of a society under threat. And the other thing there wasn't is there wasn't this obsessive focusing on crime. You know, if you go to the United States and turn on the television channel, to any television channel at any time, you are going to see a program like CSI with maimed corpses everywhere, spurting blood. Or you could switch the channel and see Jack Bauer chopping off a terrorist's hand with a hacksaw. Or you could turn to CNN and you will see an ex-prosecutor named Nancy Grace screaming and yelling for vengeance about some recent criminal trial. And then you'll turn to your local news and you'll see who was murdered, who was raped, who was bludgeoned and beaten in your local community. And I, get, I came to realize America is somehow obsessed by violence and we can't get over it somehow. And then I came to Europe and I realized somehow this, these countries they have not gotten rid of violence. There is still a problem with criminality in Germany, but it's not this pervasive focus of fear. You can live your life without ever really thinking about crime or prison in Germany, except when you turn on Tatort and you see you know, a completely unrealistic scenario. Um, just, but that's a crimi, that's a thriller, that's fun. And then I went and visited European prisons, and I went and you know, talked to, to, you know, to prosecutors and defense attorneys, and I realized that the way the criminal justice system functions in Europe, I found that to be a much more civilized and humane way of doing things. Because as some of you know, there's a law in Germany called the Strafvollzugsgesetz that says when you are put into prison, the purpose of that is to, as Robert Blecker just summarized, is to first of all protect society, from your f possible future crimes while you're in prison and to prepare you for re-entry into society. And to me, that was a profoundly hopeful and optimistic approach to human nature. You could also call it naive because there are lots of German criminals who are very nasty people and have you know, serious prob mental problems. And I do believe that certain people are evil, a very tiny, tiny number of them, but I certainly believe that's possible. But the system is operating on the presumption that we are not going to give up on anybody. No matter what you have done, no matter how awful your crime, 
you will be punished. You will be segregated from society. Society will be kept safe from you. But we are going to always have as a fundamental principle of our criminal justice system the notion that anybody can be reclaimed as a functioning member of society. That doesn't mean they will be reclaimed. It, but the, the, the system is aspirational. It is setting a goal. It is articulating a hopeful premise about human nature. And it allows people, when they get out of prison, they can keep their criminal history secret in, in, in most circumstances. And, you know, Germans tend to be, many Germans are very skeptical of their criminal justice system, but many of them find that to be in Ordnung, you know, the, to be perfectly appropriate. Because the idea is everybody in society has a stake in making sure that prisoners are genuinely rehabilitated so that they can continue to lo live decent lives. Why? Because the person living right next to you in your apartment might be a released criminal and you will never know it and you have no way of finding it out unless it was a very famous case that was reported in the newspapers. And so this means that you have to believe in this principle of rehabilitation too. If the system is really not correcting people, if it's really releasing them back into society when they are danger, then that is your concern as well. Now, of course, we know that the German system does this. There are people who are released from prison and commit further crimes. The system does fail in Germany. The recidivism rate, Rückfahrquote, that's the, that's, you know, if you're released from Germany, if you're released from prison, what is the chance that you will go back to prison for a new crime in Germany? It's about 30%. So the system fails about 30% of the time in Germany. But in the United States, where there are much longer prison sentences, so the average prison sentence for an armed robbery in the United States is 10 years in prison. The average sentence for an armed robbery, a Raubüberfall in Germany, is about 18 months in prison. So American prison sentences for similar crimes are about seven times longer than in Germany. And what is the recidivism rate in America? It's 40%. Now, you can't directly compare the numbers. There's lots of statistical footnotes. But uh, so, you know, I'm not going to say that any, neither system is hugely superior in preventing future crime. But the key thing is the American system, which is much more brutal and much more harsh and much more punitive, doesn't get anything for that. It doesn't achieve anything. It doesn't make people safer. And so I thought to myself, the thing is, you can actually articulate a more humane version of treatment of criminals in which you invest resources in bringing them back into society and reintegrating them. And not only will it not increase the danger to society, this you know, allegedly luxurious treatment in hotel-like prisons actually makes society safer because the people who are in those prisons Actually, their dignity is respected, they have rights, and they are reintegrated into society, and about, you know, most of the time, it actually works. And they do live out the rest of their lives, at least without being convicted of a new crime. And so that got me thinking, you know, these sort of ideals, the, uh, these ideas and also ideals about criminal punishment that I always had, you know, I saw them largely being realized in Europe. Or what I saw was a system that came much closer to realizing these ideals than anything I had experienced, especially in Texas. And so that led me, I still believe in retributivism in the sense that I do believe that punishments should be you know, you should, you should gauge the punishment by how much harm was done and what the state of mind of the offender is. And I do believe people, some people, do need to go to prison. I believe it's a very small number of people who need to go to prison. But I believe that the German or the Swedish, you know, or the Finnish approach to prison confinement respects human values like dignity and the worth of all people and expresses a fundamentally positive and optimistic and hopeful view of human nature and actually contributes significantly to a decreased level of violence and a decreased level of fear in society. And that's why I believe that ret retributive thinking, sure, it should play a small part in how we look at crime, but that rehabilitation, even when it doesn't work, says something noble and inspiring about the society that tries it. 
And that's the kind of society that I like paying my taxes to. So that is my opening statement. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to see that la the last evening hasn't impaired Andrew's cognitive abilities and eloquence. Uh, now Robert Blacker will have five minutes to respond. Well, I might take a few more since I, my opening statement was relatively brief, ha half yeah. that length, mm -hmm. uh, because I prefer to react r rather than present. Let me, let me establish some common ground uh, here. First of all, for those prisoners who we're going to release back into society, we most certainly want them to be released back into society more able to integrate with society and no longer be the threat that they once were and no longer be the negative presence that they once were. And in that sense, rehabilitation becomes a primary purpose of punishment for those who we're sending back. And the fact is that um, Andrew is, is correct. The, I can't speak for Germany because I don't know how successful you've been in rehabilitating your prisoners. I can tell you that in the United States in general, uh, it's been a terrible failure. It's um, something that doesn't get much attention. We've sort of surrendered to its impossibility. I'm quite aware as to why it fails. One of the uh, prisoners I got closest to, a convicted murderer uh, named Itchy, uh, David Leon Brooks, once said to me that the lessons that you learn in 25 years in prison you forget in 25 days when you're out on the street. And it's perfectly understandable. The, the prisoner, the long-term prisoner is released with no job prospects, as Andrew said, that's correct, or very poor ones. He suddenly becomes a huge drain on his family so that not only is he not contributing, but he's taking away from them the, the, with no legitimate job prospects. The only one who's offering him any opportunities typically are those on the streets who offer him some free drugs to get back into the game. And so with the pressure mounting, eventually he succumbs to it. So there's very little difference of opinion between us when it comes to the failure of rehabilitation largely in the United States for those that we release. Where the difference is, and it is significant, is what our attitude is and what our practices are when we're dealing with those people who he conceded, and it surprised me that he conceded, those people who he conceded are, quote, evil. Those people who have done incredibly vicious things, those people whose human dignity he is so concerned with protecting and promoting. Now, the German system, in its purposes of punishment, does not articulate uh, retribution, but it does articulate retribution in the German criminal code. It, artic it articulates retribution at least in two spots. One is in the uh, Article 46 that says that the, that the guilt of the uh, a prisoner is, uh, to quote exactly, the guilt of the perpetrator is the foundation for determining punishment. Guilt. So we can't talk about legitimate punishment without paying some attention to guilt. And um, secondly, and here's where it's clearest, in, in provision 57A of the German criminal code, it says that uh, presumptively a person even with a life sentence shall be released, as everyone is released after doing two-thirds of the sentence, 15 years, except, this is how the presumption is rebutted, except when the judge determines that he's a future danger, he remains dangerous to society at large, we're still then within the future-oriented perspective on punishment, or the guilt, the, let's, let, let me be exactly right, um, the particular gravity of the convicted person's guilt warrants continuing his punishment. So we have even here, there's only one way to interpret that and understand that, that's retribution. That means even if you are no future danger or future threat, your guilt may warrant your being kept in. Now, we, we hear about the mild system of punishment, the humane system of punishment. And the question I have is, is it a just system of punishment? The European societies, and they do vary. I mean, you know, let's, let's think about Norway for a moment. And um, Breivik, I hope I don't mispronounce his name. Is, is it Breivik? 
Uh, Breivik, uh, um, I assume you all know who I'm talking about, someone who first killed seven people, then methodically went to the island in the political party, which he uh, uh, thought was the root of all Norway's evils. This is very recent. And then uh, killed another uh, 87 people, methodically hunted them down and killed them. Uh, most of them were young. Most of them were in their late teens and early 20s. Breivik faces a maximum under the Norwegian system if he's convicted of his multiple murder of 21 years in prison. He's likely to be sent to a prison in which the theory is just as explained, how humane, how dignified. The officers will try to help improve his morals. They will try to help him be re-educated they will, in fact, be engaged in recreation with him. They will be all part of a community. In fact, the measurement of punishment in Germany and almost all European societies is solely by the duration, how long someone is in prison for. But that's only half of it. The other half is the experience, how long. If somebody murders children, if somebody methodically hunts down and kills 80 people, I feel certain as a retributivist, not just rationally, but really certain. I feel certain that he deserves to be in prison for the rest of his life if we do not kill him. He should never be free. I don't care who he becomes. We make a covenant with the past for the 90 people who he killed, for the 90 innocent people that he killed, at the very least, he should never be free again. And while he is in permanent captivity, while he lives his life out in prison, he should not be playing tennis and volleyball watching color television on a flat screen TV set, being treated to delicious food, having plenty of visits, having recreation constantly with, the, with his guards who become fellow members of his community. This, I maintain, is fundamentally unjust. This makes punishment disproportionate to the crime. And ultimately, the reason that the punishment is disproportionate to the crime is that it's not deserved. It's not enough. And the reason that it's not enough is because the past, the acts, the attitudes, the harm, and the voices of the victims demand an adequate response, demand that it be put in balance. If you don't understand this, if you don't feel this, if your intuitions don't tell you this, there's no way that I can ever persuade you of this. But my suspicion is that more than a few of you feel certain that I too am right, now in a culture that has shamed you out of expressing those feelings. They cannot shame you out of feeling those feelings, but the elites in German society, who have always taken the lead, have shamed the people out of expressing their true feelings, have suppressed those feelings, and have devised a prison system in which the quality of life inside is simply, for the worst of the worst, unjust. Thank you, um, Andrew, five minutes to respond.